Next up, I want to talk about errors and bugs in your code. First of all, you're going to notice that now you don't see the first section anymore. This is because the new version of the um, plugin with the table of contents here allows to collapse and extend the individual chapters. So I'm always only having all the other chapters collapsed when I'm showing you this. Okay, errors. You've seen them probably many times already. So these are all the errors and exceptions here Python throws you. It makes sense to read this list to know when which occurs. And just as much, of course, it makes sense to read your error message. So imagine we're having, oops, we're having here a statement print, hello. Then we're gonna see if we run it in an IPython cell, it's gonna show it like this, They're in this file, so some kind of IPython insert, this is what it converts this cell to. In line one, we're having the syntax error, especially at this character, it notices, it notices the error, missing parentheses to call print, and even tells me how to correct it here. So this is how it looks in Jupyter. If you're having it on a terminal like this, you're going to see it's in the file standard in, which is what you what, what happens if you're typing what you're typing on if you're typing the terminal or if you have it in a line of code, it's going to be it's going to show it like this. So in line one of this in this file, as you see, I copied this message, I copied some of the first parts of this, but I upgraded them now. Okay, and if for example this error occurs so what you're having in python is you're having the call stack right so if you are if you have a function def print hello and there you have the error and you call this function from outside it's gonna give you the oh, there's no column uh, it's gonna give you the entire call stack not for syntax errors. Yeah, no. no. I'm not printing. Okay. So for syntax errors, it's not going to show you the entire call stack, but for all other errors, it's going to show you the entire call stack. So how we read this error message is that in this and this file, which simply means Jupyter input side in this case, in module, module is everything which is not inside a class or function, but in well. Module is simply what is the indentation, what has the indentation level null, zero. And inside this, it calls the print hello function. This is the first stack, all right? So it sets a function stack. Every time Python calls a function, it puts this function onto a stack. Why a stack? Well, because there's the first element on here, which is the module, and then on top of that, there's a new function, which on top of that calls a new function. And once this here returns, it's gonna go back to this. Once this here returns, it's gonna go back to this. This is the stack. Why does it's a call stack? I'm going to show you a visual example of this in a second too. Okay, and inside the module, this function here calls the print hello function. So this is the function called print hello, such that now we're here at print hello, and this tells me in line two, which is this one here, we have a zero division error here. Or for example, this stack goes even further. So I had here in this this and this file and this and this line. Should never be this long, this is not good style. In the main function, I had this reveal solutions function, and inside this reveal solutions function, which is at this very line, I opened some non existing file, and in the line with open and then the file name, I had this error, and then it tells me the error and the error message. And then it tells me process finished with execute one, which means there was some kind of error in there. So this is, for example, how um, PyCharm tells me shows me the error. Okay, so this is what you're gonna see if you're having a call stack. And now how you see the error in your auto grading, in your auto edit grading, it's looking like this. So let me show you by going to my very own dashboard here. So I also attempted homework 04 and it tells me it points 10 out of 25 and I can now click the check Y link, which leads me to the GitHub action. So this here is my GitHub repository for this homework. And simply then the action tab for the, and this is the action for the newest commit. I'm gonna see, set up job, don't care for this, don't care for this, don't care for this, don't care for this, but the auto grading, this is what I care for. And we see this had an error. Then it simply installs the libraries it needs, it's not important, test session starts, and now we see task one, pass, task two, working on it, tries to install stuff, pass two task, task two, worked, task three, blah, blah. Now we see, aha, failures. 
Now we see that it's testing this and fails when testing this. And now we see here the errors in there. And this is how we read now an error from um, an auto grading. So first of all, it simply PyTest copies me a few lines here and then it tells me the error was in this very line. And the error was that it asserted one equals zero, where one is the result of this function with this arguments, where this function is this function in my code and the arguments here is some built-in function array at the position zero and this built-in function array is np.array. This tells me the entire call stack too and even explains to me what the um, things were. And then it tells me it failed here at an assertion one equals zero and thus I did not get the points for test three. So this is how you read a PyTest error. Okay, so how do we deal with errors? Well, we deal with errors using try accept, right? So if you're trying to access a dictionary at a position where there is none, we get a key error and accept this key error, we, for example, add the key. It's easier to ask for forgiveness and for permission. That's what we're doing here. Okay, or for example, if we want to open a file, what we're doing is we're first of all using a context manager here, such that we make sure this file is closed anyway. But if we get an IO error at this very line, what we're doing is we're catching it and telling, for example, could not open file and doing the other behavior. Okay, so this is how we're dealing with errors. Yes, but well, of course, there are not always errors and exceptions you're supposed to handle like this. And sometimes your code is simply plain wrong. Okay, so this is why I have a short checklist here to handle errors and bugs in your code. So first of all, read the message, try to understand it. That's what we did before that. Go to the respective line. However, sometimes the reason for a uh, 40 line may actually lie in the line before. So for example, if we're forgetting, looking this example, so in this line we're making something, we forget the closing parentheses, and then we're having a line and after that, we see now Python's gonna notice the error only at line two, even though the error lies at the line before that. Okay, so sometimes the error may in the line before that. So always, it's really useful to use a good IDE that supports syntax highlighting. And if I had this open in PyCharm, PyCharm would start underlining me this part here already because PyCharm would know where well, you're closing. Even JupyterLab knows that now if I have a new parentheses, now it looks correct and this one would be wrong. That's their way. Okay, so using IDEs with syntax highlighting really helps for this kind of syntax errors. Google what this type of error usually means. Or look at the list of exceptions here and what especially what it means in the context of the libraries you're using or with the error text it gives also always really helpful if possible split your line to multiple lines to get a more precise location like i said i love one-liners but here one-liners are really not good so imagine i'm having this line here which is from some solution and i'm having some kind of error in this long line what i would do is i would split up the line and for example I would um, split up the list comprehension here into the components what it does and that is basically a for loop right so we're copying this part here and then can make it like this we're extracting this curl split can't follow him right now with it can understand and then I'm making QF at the position TMP uh, at the position end of TMP here equals and then I can make that TMP here. Now I see I'm getting the error in this line. So here it made sense already but I'm getting the error here because TMP, well, either here or here, I think I can even do it like this. No, I can't, I can't do it like this. This doesn't work. Um, so we can do first equals, and then first, now I'm getting the error at this line. This is wrong, this is not first, this is second. <laughs> so I'm getting the error when it tries to convert this here to an integer. And now I can backtrack 
And basically the error was here that I didn't uh, take, so I split at the plus, so I got this part, and then I split at the x, so I got this part. So I won't get this error anymore if I project this. So this is probably not the best example because the error rate stems from a line before that, but still now I see the precise location where the error occurs. If I split that up also, for example, there it makes sense to make um, to well, make from this comprehensions or did comprehensions like I used here to make normal loops again such that you have more lines. Okay, after reading then the error, of course, we search the web, we search for error messages, docs, etc., etc. Okay, so um, first step should always be the official documentation, which is docs.python.org or whatever the module is you're working with. So simply Google, I don't know, SciPy docs. So for example, SciPy docs, and this should give you the SciPy docs already. So and there you can look up uh, the reference of how to call functions, what arguments functions take, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, make sure that when you are ever concerned specific library, you ensure that you're searching for the correct version. That also holds for Python version, okay? If you're getting help for Python 2, this does not necessarily help you for Python 3 because some things are different Python 2 and 3. And sometimes when library upgrades, you're getting errors that you didn't get in the previous version. So if we look at the Python docs, simply Python docs, um, we see that this is a documentation for Python 3.8. We're not using Python 3.8, so we'd have to switch to Python 3.7. There's not much different, but there are some things different. For example, like I said, sorted dictionaries aren't there in Python 3.5. Try to search the Internet for error message. So this is basically the thing I'm always doing, of course. So I simply copy my error message and Google it. So make sure if I Google my error, I use wildcards instead of find them. So if it tells me there's an error for some string or something which is where for example in somehow on a path to my machine or something like this then well i have to use a white card for this path so simply a star for example who you can use google with white cards you can also limit your search to stack overflow using side colon stack overflow when google when googling okay so this makes really much sense and basically googling your error is the first thing you always do right it shouldn't be your first but it's not the first yes been someone who had this problem before and there's a stack overflow answer. I encourage you if you see stack overflow answers for your problems to not copy stack overflow answers ever. That's advice always given to people learning a new programming language or learning to code in general. Never copy solutions. Type them character by character because this way you learn much more and next time you won't need to Google it because you typed it over and you know it. Try to isolate the error. Break up your code into smaller functions instead of one monolithic block. So normally, and this is true, a function or a method in any programming language is never supposed to be more than like five or 10 lines, never. You shouldn't have one function which ex executes a block of code monolithically from, like a function is supposed to be one thing. It's supposed to do one thing. And if it does other things inside it, where well, these are supposed to be other functions. So it's supposed to be always atomic. So split your code into four smaller functions which have well-defined input and output. If you're doing bigger projects, this is where you would do unit testing too. So you're giving a function a certain input and telling you the function, telling the function, this is the output I want to have. So every single function should normally have a test. We don't do this here because writing the test takes as long as writing the code. If you're not sharing the code or debugging too often, that doesn't make sense. But Smaller functions always make sense. And create a minimal reproducible example that still contains the error. This is really, really useful. And 90% of times, you will notice what was wrong when creating this. Because if you're taking out this piece of your code, the error does not occur anymore. However, if you still have this piece of code in there, the error is now um, it's still there. So you're going to see that this piece is probably what's responsible for the error. 90% of times you don't notice what was wrong when creating a minimal reproducible example. Example. Okay, so this is really useful to find out the error, but you need it anyway if you want to post if you want to post your problem to Stack Overflow or the like. Okay, so this here is the official help of Stack Overflow of how to create such a minimal complete reproducible example. Really useful you should always do this. Okay, next up, try rubber ducking. I actually have a literal rubber duck in front of my screen right now. 
So what robot hacking is, you're supposed to tell somebody about that problem you're having. You're supposed to tell it in a way that the person, that a person that has absolutely no knowledge of the matter understands your problem. So explain using simple words what each of, why each line of your code is obviously correct. And at some point you will be unable to do so, either because you don't understand what you wrote or because it's wrong or both. And this is then probably where the bug is. Okay? And really often you'll notice your error when explaining. So your rubber duck could be your mom who has never done any bit of coding or even a literal rubber duck because it's not important that so some people can, of course, ask good questions. But even this person doesn't know coding, it still helps. Just try to explain your code to a fictional person or an actual person or a rubber duck and you're going to notice what's wrong with the code during that. And if all these didn't help, well, then you may ask your question, then may help to ask your question to the community. So if you're ever concerned specific library, you must wave Stack Overflow or a specific problem to this library is the better choice. Really often Stack Overflow is the best choice because it has the, high, the biggest community, but sometimes more specific problems of this thing are the better choice. Or even the GitHub issues um, if you're having problem of whatever GitHub uh, project or library you're using. Okay, and there again, um, Stack Overflow uh, wants you to ask a question. So search and research before you're doing and then give good names, etc., etc. Okay, and also here there's another help on how to debug small, debug small programs um, for more tips that I didn't list here. Okay, one other thing in this course, stick to the aforementioned steps before you ask questions, please. Second, believe assertions in code. They cannot be wrong. If an assertion tells you the type of, type of some variable is integer or something, then the type of that variable is integer, full stop. The assertion knows it. Um, never change test files. Um, we don't tell you that yet in the dashboard, but uh, the auto grade checks if you change the test files. And well, if you make yourself pass by simply removing all the assertions from the test file, you're going to fail the task, and we notice that. But simply never change the test files because we have to manually look up every time somebody changed it and only added a white space or something. Okay. If you still can't get any further after these debug steps, um, don't hesitate to ask us. But Please, if you're asking us, provide some context to your errors. And please do not only provide this one line where the error occurred um, or this the error message without any context now. Please don't give us screenshots because in screenshots we can't well, we can't copy the code of screenshots or something. Instead, what we want you to do and what I really want you to do all the time, when you're having an error, make a commit with your current status of your work, where the error is. Push it and give us the link of your repository. Your commits in GitHub are supposed to be atomic anyway. So once you solved one task, you're supposed to make a commit anyway. It's not important if you don't do, but if there's an error, just commit, push, and give us a link. That way we can see the entire code, including the error in your GitHub. That we see everything we need to see. That way it's reproducible for us and we can copy your code and simply use it like in our machines. And we can point out 40 lines in your code by simply marking them in GitHub and sending you the link. So this is what I please want you to do all the time if you're having errors. And also giving the errors good names instead of some error or something. All right, then questions to ask while debugging. So when debugging, you should always check your data. Do the variables hold the correct data type? Is something none type? Is something a string instead of an int? How can you check that? Well, by not only printing the string or the int or the variable, uh, but also printing the type using the type function. Do the values of the variable make sense? Do you reach all the blocks in your code actually? So do you enter loops or if blocks? Are they even triggering? For example, put it print in there or something else, which I'm going to show you in a second. Are the functions executed in the right order? For example, if Python is kind of interpreted, a function can only be called after it is defined. Okay, so if we call func and then def call func pass, we're going to see call func is not defined here because where Python is interpreted and it goes through it line by line. Now it works. Okay. Okay, then I have a few general tips for you. Make sure to not overwrite built-ins. So for example, list is a built-in. So now if I, for example, I make list equals one, two, three. Okay, now I did this somewhere in my code and then years later using the same, the same kernel, I have, for example, tuple equals one, two, three. And then I want to call, I want to make this tuple into a list. Actually, let's not call tuple because that's also a built-in. Let's call it my bar 
And now I make I want to make my var list. And now it tells me list object is not callable. Why that? Well, because list now is renamed and this thing here is a list. So I could rather do list at the position one because this here works, right? Um, I can well, reset my kernel and then I have it back, but I can also make, um, I can also import built-ins and then list equals built-ins dot list. And now if I want list, then my var works. But this here you should never do, never override buildings. List, tuple, dict, str for string, all this kind of stuff. Check versions of libraries and compare to whatever hints you find. Yes, never copy code from Stack Overflow, but type it character by character to learn. Use keyword arguments instead of list arguments. So when you're having a function like this, don't call it like my func that, that, that. Um, I'd rather call it like my func first equals a second equals one because that way it's obvious and plain if you're assigning the so you can change the order or you can for example eventually I want to add a parameter here so um, other param and now if I call them like this this still works correctly so this makes sense um, use assertions and as instance often don't rely on printing so um, and also don't rely on printing variables without printing the type as well. So use assertion. This is what I'm showing here. So this is a function. And yes, I know I called you the Python Hartson proposal that you can, for example, make first is supposed to be an int. But I can also do it like this if I don't want to do it um, with the type annotations. I can check in my function is first an integer or a float. So a number is first bigger than zero. Is my second a string and is my third a uh, collection. Um, because of Python's duct typing, I cannot check if something is instance collection, but what all collections have in common is that, that they have an iterator such that I can check for if something has an attribute that is called iter, under iter, and then it's a collection. This is true for strings, for tuples, for lists, for you name it, collections. Okay, uh, so this is how I'm using assertions to check if everything is working the way it's supposed to. Because if I do the assertions now and I'm calling it incorrectly. Well, of course I have to remove it here. Um, now I'm seeing, ah, okay, I did that wrong here. I first was supposed to be a number and second was supposed to be a string. And now I know, ah, I have to do it like this. If I didn't do it like this, um, I would, for example, get a more cryptic error eventually. So if I didn't have these assertions in here, and I would call them wrongly, but I would get some cryptic, uh, this is not too cryptic, um, but you can imagine that there may be way more cryptic errors. So use assertions and use, for example, assertions for is instance. Okay, don't rely on printing variables without their type because sometimes it's not the type you think because if you print an integer, it looks like a string. Use logging instead of printing. Um, I'm gonna talk about logging in a minute, use both variable names instead of a or i for in, for index or something. Doc string, use doc string, use doc string, such so that when you're later looking at your code, you're gonna know what you did. If you use a number more than once, make it a variable or a constant. So never use it with magic numbers. So uh, if you want to, I don't know, print the first 10 values of your list, then and you're checking if the index you add is bigger than 10 more than once, then make this show number of lists a constant, such that if you change it eventually, you change it at all positions at the same time. And you can, for example, simply control F and search for all the occurrences of that. Never rely on functions implicitly returning none. So return none, we can make this explicit here, such that we know once this part is returning none. Python functions will always implicitly return none, but never rely on that. Make custom exceptions wherever you can, because that way you can tell a lot easier what went wrong. And use this Dunder method wrapper to make debugging easier. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, we've already seen this in the polynomial. And now, for example, I simply ran the polynomial where the sample solution of the polynomial where I removed the um, the wrapper dunder method. Now, for example, if I create a new polynomial, it looks like this. 
And if I create it here, so now I can, because I ran the code here, now I have it in this notebook. If I ran the code, now it's looking like this. And this is this doesn't look good. And if I, I want to create a polynomial, I want to see what my polynomial actually is. So as soon as I have the wrapper and I create it, now if I'm looking at an object, an instance of type polynomial, it's gonna look nice. I should even, so the wrapper is maybe not perfect, which I had, so maybe I should add the polynomial and the parentheses here such that it makes sure what it is. So normally what you do in a wrapper for debugging is you're returning self dot dunder class dot dunder name, which for this whatever is whatever in this letter piece would be letter piece. And then in parentheses, some variables of this. So this is for example, for some game I wrote a bot for, which has, so it's a game with letters on some kind of board, like Scrabble. And there was a class letter piece and this class letter piece tells its own name, the letter it has, the score it has, and then the position on the Scrabble board this letter is. And this is something really nice because if I'm now printing the letter pieces or printing the polynomial here, I'm seeing really useful information instead of simply this. I don't care where in my RAM this is. I care where my game mode this is. Okay. Okay, then I told you one important thing when debugging is logging. And to quote 2018's basic programming pattern here, yeah, often a simple print is all you need. Print there, print there, print there. Don't forget to delete your prints once you are done debugging. I strongly disagree with this. This is not what prints are for. Instead of printing, go for logging. The advantages of logging is where you can set a level, for example, the, uh, so these are level, levels, debug, info, warning, error, and critical, such that you don't always see every kind of information because standardly you only see the warnings and above, so warnings, errors, and criticals, not the debug information, not the info. Um, and these levels are for certain well, things you want to describe. So debug information is detailed information of interest only when diagnosing problems. Info is confirmation that things are working as expected. Warnings are indications that something unexpected has happened, whether the software is still working as expected. Error is more serious and critical is a very serious error that the problem itself may be unable to continue running. Okay, and the advantages, so Printing is for a different purpose. You want to print stuff which is information for the user and not debug information and not something like this. And for to not have to delete your prints once you're done debugging, well, use logging instead so you don't have to delete these logs because you can automatically um, make these logs visible or invisible simply by using, for example, um, by using one, one simple command. Okay, logging automatically as the time and the Oops, the function in which it occurred and the ah, module here, and the module in which it occurred and the function in which it was called. You can adjust logging behavior of every single call using one function call. So I can make, for example, I can change that all my logs now at the time or that all my logs now at the function where they are called using one single call instead of having to change every single print. You can easily log two files using simply one argument and you can en enable and disable logging or the logging level using command line arguments. Okay, so how do we do logging? We import the logging and then we simply use logging dot, for example, warning or info. Now it looks like this standardly. I see here, I see the level, which is here warning. And then I see where it happens, which is here root. I'm gonna get to how to get rid of this because it, for now it shows always root in a second. And then the error or whatever, the message basically, okay? And I'm seeing here that I don't show the info because standardly I'm only showing warning and above, okay? However, I can change the configuration of my logging using logging.basicconfig. And here I can, for example, add the time and at the level and the message. And I can show which level, so level is what we saw here. And I can show which level I want to see. So if I want to see also the infos and everything above, which is warning error and critical, I can use level logging.info. If I also want to see the debug information, I can level is logging.debug. Uh, okay, and then I can even change the date format. And using one argument, I could simply file name, I could write my log to, for example, example.log. Not that this has to be the first thing you're running um, when importing log. This doesn't, it's not too bad on files because you're running the file once anyway. 
Um, but if you are working in interactive kernels, you have to reset the kernel. We start the kernel. So I import logging again. Now I run this. Uh, now I run this, and after that, my logs um, are going to be like this. So this must be the first thing after importing the logging module. Now I'm seeing the date, the um, level, and the error here. And I see even this is using this 8s makes it eight spaces long. So it's a string on eight characters. Okay. Could, for example, additionally add the file name and the function name using these here. Again, I have to restart my kernel, import logging again, now I this config. Now it even tells me where the file here is. So we've seen already above this IPython input. And the first one here, this one here, is in my module. So it's in the indentation equals zero area. This here, the info out, uh, is also in the module. and this here is in the my func. And this is so much more useful because this already tells you really much. Okay, and these are two links of how to logging and um, these are the log record attributes, which is what I used here. So level name, file name, func name and message are um, some of the things you can use here. You can also add like the thread in which tokens if you're using multi-threading, etc, etc. Okay, so what are all these things for? So if you want to display console of ordinary use of a command line script or program, use print. If you want to report events that occur during normal operation of a program for states monitoring, fault investigation, then use logging.info or if it's very detailed output, logging.debug. If you want to issue a warning, warnings.1. Um, if you want to report an error regarding a particular event, you raise an exception. And if you want to report an error with, without stopping the program, so without raising an exception, then you can use logging.error or logging.exception or logging.critical. Um, this is, for example, in my auto grading, I'm always throwing exceptions, which is why as soon as one exception occurred, my auto grading crashes. So I do it on purpose because I wanted to stop when there's an exception because I, it's not supposed to be that stable. I just want to get rid of all the errors myself. So that's why I'm raising exceptions in that case. But to make this program run all the time, I so should instead simply raise a logging or simply give a logging.critical or logging.exception there instead of raising the exception. Okay, so use logging instead of printing. Or even better, use debuggers. I'm going to get to that right after I talk to you, talk to you about working with multiple files and imports.